Good morning. Welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here this morning. We're going to welcome those that are in the parking lot and also those that are joining us online. For those that are here in person, we have a welcome card in the pew in front of you. If you would just fill in your name and the address if you're new. And then on the back, if you want to put a prayer request, go ahead and do that and we'll pray for that later. And if you do put a prayer request, just fold those in half and the ushers will be by and just a moment to pick those up. We have a few announcements for you. We wanted to remind you that our mission of the month is Aunt Susie's. They help people that have been diagnosed with cancer. They'll give them um, trips to the hospital or to appointments. They also give them um, dignity kits and they help them with gift certificates and cleaning house and so many other things. If you wanna give to that, just use the a pink envelope and then place that in the offering when it comes by after a while. If you have a prayer request that needs to go out for the church to know, you want to contact Lynn Wiles. And also today is the last day that they're collecting laundry detergent and uh, products for the Eagle Scout project. And if you want to bring things this afternoon, there is a box outside for you to put those items in. Our quilting group meets on Thursdays from 10 to 2. You're welcome to join them any part of that. Our prayer shawl ministry gives out shawls to people in the hospital or in the nursing home. So if you know someone that would benefit from our prayer, please make sure you get one of those for them. Our next committee meeting is June 14th, and that is an open meeting. You are welcome to join us. The next food distribution is May 21st, and that's from 9 until noon for residents of Perry Township. If you know anyone in need, all they need to do is drive up and they will fill up their trunk, or they can walk in and they'll give them bags. Uh, we're starting a new Bible study after uh, worship, uh, developing a faith that works on the book of James. So that's a new study. You're welcome to join us for that as well. We want to wish Ernie and Marilyn a happy anniversary. Don't forget, get them some flowers or something. <laughs> it's a good thing you come to church, so we remind you of stuff like this. If you'd like to give flowers for the altar on Sunday, there's a sign-up sheet right outside the pastor's office. And we are having a combined all daughters banquet and all sons banquet, so you are welcome to join us on June 5th. That's at 530 However, we will need the numbers of people that are coming, so there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. Just make sure you fill that out and let us know how many people from your family are coming. I think they're going to have chicken piccata. I couldn't find a picture of that that fast, so it will look different than that. And our choir practice is Wednesdays at 7 p.m., and you too can get a red nose. <laughs> Let's worship.
Thank you, Janet. We've been asking God for direction in our church, and would you join me in the prayer that we've been asking him for? Gracious and loving Lord, thank you for giving our leaders and members fresh vision for our church. Raise up leaders to lead new ministries in our church and community. Use us to make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able, would you stand and join us in singing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. You may be seated. Today is graduation Sunday and we, we celebrate the fact that we have some folks that are graduating and we know that graduation marks a mi major milestone in life. It's a time when we celebrate the accomplishments and transitions to another phase. And today we are celebrating two of our graduates. We have Caitlin Croft, who's graduating from Tuslaw High School. You may not recognize her there. And she will be attending Stark State College. And she will be majoring in social work, I believe. And there's her graduation picture, not quite yet. <laughs> and Kaylee Croft is also graduating from Tuslaw High School. And she will be attending the University of Akron and majoring in criminal intelligence analysis. So be careful. So she hopes to go on to law school. So if you would come up so we can uh, recognize you and acknowledge you. Don't be shy. So can we, can we pray over these folks? As your classes and gradings are now complete, we ask that you may strive towards excellence in all that you do. As the graduation speeches conclude, may you raise your voices to pronounce justice and peace in the world. And as all the fanfares cease, may you sing of joy even in dark and lonely places. And as the applause quiets, may you celebrate and lift up those around you. As you graduate this year, may your achievements grow and cause growth in your communities. 
And may we all know the overwhelming blessing of the one who created all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we also have a, a special scholarship that the church gives out. Trinity United Methodist Church started a scholarship committee and program several years ago. And if you know Chuck John saying every April to raise money for the scholarship program. And the requirements that we have for the scholarship are pretty tough. The students have to be active. They have to volunteer both in church and the community. They have to be a regular attendee of our church and involved in youth group. And this year we have one applicant that submitted an application. And the scholarship committee has voted unanimously to award the scholarship to this recipient. This individual has excelled in every area. She received student of the month in May in Tesla. She was employee of the year where she works at the big salad place across the street, if you know what I mean. <laughs> she participates in band and she's learned several instruments, including bassoon, which she's played here. At Trinity, she was liturgist before COVID and she helped with children's moments. She's also done solos and been involved in several plays for Easter and the live nativity, thanks to Brett. <laughs> She's also helped with various missions and even one year has sang in choir. This person has helped paint Perry Help and Perry Rooms downstairs and the old nurseries downstairs. She's helped with several dinners and even made cookies to help the raise money for the youth. And then in addition to all that, she helps out on Saturdays passing out food for Perry Helping Perry. And then she, outside of the church, she's helped paint the clothes closet and volunteered there as well. So Kaylee, you probably know who this is. On behalf of the church, we present you with, with a check for $500 to use however you would like. So we want to thank her for all of her efforts. Thank you very much. We come to our children's moments. And I just thought, you know, another person that taught in the scripture was Elijah. Now, usually when there was a prophet or a rabbi, they would have a group of students that would learn underneath them. And Elijah was no different. He had a whole group of, of other prophets that would learn from him. But there was one of them that excelled much more than the rest, and that was Elisha. And he said, you know what? When, when I go, I'm going to pass this on. And he kept trying to avoid Elisha and just leave him behind. But he says, you know what? I'm going to stick to you really close. And that's what a real student does to their teacher. And on behalf of that, when Elijah was taken up into the air, into the heavens, he received his mantle and, and kind of like the baton that he passed on. So let's pray. Dear gracious Lord, there are many people in our lives that have educated us and trained us and helped us to learn. And Lord, we just ask that we would be good students, that we would learn the lessons that you have for us, and that we would be able to teach those lessons to those that follow us, and that we would be able to pass on that baton as well. In your name we pray, amen.
In keeping with our theme, today we're going to talk about what would Jesus say to graduates. So would you read with me from Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, everywhere that we turn in this world, there's challenges and questions and conflicts. We have opinions and reactions and judgments and even arguments, and they seem to come from all directions. So how do Jesus' words speak to the issues that we face today? In fact, what would Jesus say to our graduates? Now, when you graduate from college, your parents are kind of celebrating because they're done writing out checks, amen? And now you're kind of really on your own. College graduates, though, have a little bit more anxiety because they're thinking, oh, no, now what do I do? I'm supposed to be all grown up. Now I've got to start making a living. What am I going to do now? So what would Jesus say if he was giving the commencement address at high school or college? Now the most predominant question asked of high school students by friends and family is, what do you want to do with your life? Now that's an interesting question to ask. Are you supposed to have that all figured out at 18? Are you supposed to know what you're going to be doing for the next 50 years of your career when you're 18? I wonder if many of you that are over 18 actually are doing what you dreamed of doing when you were 18. Now, I thought I would be working in computer science with programming. I had grown up in a different denomination that didn't even have women preachers, so I would have never envisioned doing what I am today. And for most people, you're going to change your careers at least five times during the course of your life. And this includes changing jobs and even entire career directions. So my guess is you probably don't have it figured out all yet, at least. And after a while, I think they get tired of people asking the question. Now, I would suggest that it's, it's possible to know what you're doing for the next 50 years of your life and beyond. But it doesn't have anything to do with a specific career field. It has to do with a bigger mission for your life. It's a bigger vision. And that's what Jesus would talk about today. Now, for this preparation, I listened to a lot of different commencement addresses. And in 2012, Oprah was speaking to Spelman University this is a historically a black college for women. And it's for Christian school. It's located in Atlanta. And she began with the very same question. What do you want to do with your life? Oprah said, I don't want to just be successful in this world. I don't want to just leave a mark or have a legacy. She said, the answer for me is I want to fulfill the highest truest expression of myself as a human being. I want to fill, fulfill the promise that the creator dreamed when he made all the cells that formed me. She continued to say, you must have some vision for your life, even if you don't know the plan. You have to have some direction in which you choose to go. And then she said, I was never the kind of woman that would just get into a car and go for a ride. She would have a boyfriend that would say, let's go for a ride. And she wanted to know, well, where are we going? Do we have a destination? Is there a plan or are you just hiding? 
you know, there was a couple things that I really loved in her speech. The first was this. Would you read it with me? I want to fulfill the purpose of the creator when he dreamed me up. It's the idea that the one that knit you together in your mother's womb actually gave you gifts and abilities and talents, and that somehow all of your life experiences are used for a life purpose and a vision for your life. But I also want to be clear about this because some people think that God has a perfect plan for your life, who you're going to marry, where you go to college, what you're going to do with your career, and over and over again, but you know, we don't always figure out what this is and you pray, God, who do you want me to marry? But you know, it isn't that easy, amen? If it was that clear and God already had a plan spelled out for you, I think he would make it clearer to us. But when we determine where we want to go to college, we weigh things. Here's what I think personally. I think about God's plan for our lives, and I think it's less about where you go to college, whether you go to this college or that college, or whether you marry this person or that person. Now, of course, there are times when one person would be a better choice than another, and it's less about which job you take or which state you live in, and it's more about the values in which you live your life. God's plan for you has more to do with how you live your life rather than a specific decision. Now, daily we're making different decisions on his plan or whether this fulfills his plan or this doesn't fulfill his plan. But I think it has less to, go to, to do with where you go to work or even who you marry or how you live your life as somebody that's married. It's more about how you go about work ethics in your career and how you go about being married. I think those are the things that Jesus is interested in. Now, the second thing that I like about what, what Oprah had to say is you have to have a vision for your life. In fact, there's a proverb that says if you don't have vision, the people perish. Now, maybe you don't know what you're going to do for the next 50 years. You know, maybe you know just bits and pieces, and maybe you have some ideas. But the bigger vision that we're meant to have surrounds God. It's this idea of what does my life exist for? This is what I'm meant to be doing no matter what my career is, where I go to college, or who I marry. Jesus talked about this overarching vision for our lives, and he preached about it constantly. And he called it the kingdom of God. Over a hundred times in, in the Gospels, he teaches about this concept of the kingdom of God. His very first sermon was about the kingdom of God. In fact, everything that Jesus did, did is an expression about this kingdom of God. This is what our vision of life is meant to be about. Because we can't understand Jesus without this concept of the kingdom of God. So I think it's helpful to ingrain that in our mind if we're a follower of Jesus Christ. Every act of healing, every act of deliverance, every act of mercy and compassion, every sermon that he gave was about the kingdom of God. Even his suffering and dying on the cross and his resurrection was about the kingdom of God. So you're probably saying, well, what is this kingdom of God? Well, the word literally means the reign of God. It's the rule of God. Even the Jewish people would believe and pray, blessed are you, king of the universe, for he is king of everything. Now, on this particular planet, he gave human beings the choice to decide whether they live as God as their king or they don't. When we live as God as our king, we wake up every day and say, here I am, Lord, send me, use me. We seek to do his will in our lives. We seek to live either selfishly or unselfishly. We can be focused on what we want or we can be focused on what God wants. And you know what? The choice is always ours to make. When you say things like, I belong to God and I want to live my life as though God is my king, 
that makes a difference in how you live your life. Even when the disciples would ask Jesus, well, how should we pray? He said this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He was saying God's will, not mine. And the earthly church in the beginning would pray that every single day. They would say, not my kingdom, but your kingdom come. Thy will be done as earth as it is in heaven. So when Jesus was on the earth working all these miracles, you could see people delivered from sickness or mental illness or demon possession or people that were offered love and grace, maybe for the first time. He said, when you witness these types of things, the kingdom of God is on you. And then later he said, would you read it with me? The kingdom of God is within you. It's our values. It's the heart. It's knowing that God is our king and then yielding ourselves to God and seeking to do God's will in our life. Friends, that's the vision that we have. So when we graduate from high school, people will ask us, what are you going to do with your life? The answer inside your heart, if you seek to do God's will, is I'm going to seek to love God with everything that's in me. I'm going to seek to love my neighbor as myself. I'm going to seek to do justice and love righteousness and walk humbly with God. I'm going to seek to see the places in the world and don't look away from the way God wants it to look, and I want to help heal the world. I'm going to help repair the earth and make it look more like his kingdom. That's our mission on this earth. Amen? No matter what career field you choose, we want to pursue that. Now there's a gentleman, Ronald Heifetz, He's a senior lecturer and public speaker at Harvard's Kennedy School, and he wrote this book, Leadership Without Easy Answers. And he was talking about leadership, and he shared this graphic image. And this image will work with a vision and mission of your life. And he said that leaders look at the world as it is, that bottom line. It's kind of this is the way the world is. And then he identified how the world is supposed to be. That's the clear line. And then he said, in between is a gap. There's a difference between how the world is and how the world is supposed to be. That's the kingdom of God's view. And Heifet said, the job as a leader or as a Christian is to notice that gap, and then our job is to try to close that gap. Our mission is to help the world look more like the kingdom of God. So no matter what you do, tell your neighbor, no matter what you do, you wake up in the morning and you say, here I am, Lord. Open my eyes and let me see the places that you need me. Open my ears to hear and use me. Use these hands of mine, my voice, my mind, my heart, everything that I have my resources, my pocketbook, or my wallet. Help me to make the world as it's supposed to be. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, we're not only just supposed to pray that, we're meant to live that. Do you want to know what the overall direction of your life is? You don't need to know the specifics, not the exact specifics. But you do need to have a vision for where you're going. When you go to college, you're supposed to be equipped no matter what you study. And your daily work is part of our mission field. Now, there are some things that we shouldn't do with our life, amen? For most career fields, you can actually do those and pursue God's vision. You can implement God's values with your customers, with your employees, with your coworkers, or even your colleagues. You can do that with almost every single career field, but not all of them. There are some jobs that you're not closing the gap, but you're making the gap bigger, where you have a job that actually brings pain to other people, where you're in a job that you make the world a worse place instead of a better place. 
if the career field that you are studying makes that gap larger, that is probably not the field that you want to pursue. If people are being hurt by the work you do, now even if there's a little bit of good and a whole lot of bad, you're going to be miserable at that job. You're not going to go to work feeling excited. Instead, when you get home, you're going to feel like you need a shower. Friends, that's not the type of place you want to be working. When you know that something you do brings pain to others, knowing that your vision is supposed to help people, maybe that's one area that God's saying, you know, this isn't a possibility for your career. But I suggest in almost every single career field, with a few exceptions, are places that we can live out this mission. Now, Stephen Kohlberg gave a commencement address at Northwestern University. This university was founded by Methodists. It's right outside of Chicago in Evansville. And Kohlberg also went to school there. So he went back to speak at his alma mater. And you may know him as a late night host. He's top rated in a show at night when he's there. He's a comedian. And he's one of those people that people either love him or they hate him. In fact, there's a lot of people that can't stand him. But there are people that really love him. Now, Time Magazine rated him twice as one of the most hundred influential people in America. So whether you love him or whether you hate him, I think you would appreciate some of the things that he says at this commencement address. He says, so whatever your dream is right now, if you don't achieve it, you haven't failed. You're not some kind of loser. But just as importantly, and this part is a little tougher, if you don't get the dream, it, or if you do get the dream, it doesn't necessarily make you a winner. He says, after I graduated from here, I moved down to Chicago to do improvisation. And he said, there are very few rules to improvisation, well, one lesson that he learned is you are not the most important person in the scene. If everyone else is more important than you are, then you will naturally pay attention to them and serve them. The good news is you're in the scene too, and hopefully to them you are the most important person, and they will serve you. No one is leading or following kind of the follower. Instead, you're serving the servant. He says, you can't win at improv, and all of life is like improvisation. You have no idea what's going to happen next, amen? Like improv, you can't win your life, even if it might look like you're winning. And then he continued to say, for example, I have my own show, which I love doing, and it's full of very talented people. He said, they're ready and they're eager to serve me. And he says, that's great, that's when I'm at my best, but I'm serving them just as hard. Together we have this common idea that the character Stephen Colbert is interested in everyone else. But a sure sign that things aren't going well is that nobody can remember who gave a certain idea or whose idea this was. He says, who should get credit for jokes? He goes, though naturally I get credit for them all. He said, if we should serve others and together serve some common goal or idea. For any one of you, what's that idea? And who are those people? He said, in my experience, you will truly serve only what you love because service is love made visible. If you love your friends, you'll serve your friends. If you love your community, you will serve your community. If you love money, you will serve money. If you only love yourself, you will only serve yourself. And you only have yourself. I love how he says you're not the most important person in the room. I like he, how he says you will only love or serve what you truly love. And then I like this. Would you read it with me? Service is love made visible. You know, that's true for Jesus. When he was at the Last Supper, after they had all eaten, Jesus finds a basin and a bowl that's used by slaves, and he washes all of the disciples' feet. 
he comes and washes their feet and he says, I'm trying to teach you something really important about life. That the truly great among you will be servants. In fact, that's what the creator had in mind when he created all the cells that make you up. That we serve one another. Service is captured in one word in Jesus' vocabulary, and that word is love. Now, love isn't always that warm, fuzzy feeling, but it's the way that we act, the way that we live our lives and see the needs of other people and put those needs before our own. As we seek to give ourselves to other people, to build them up, to bless them, to help them, to heal them, he says, this is what love looks like. So if you want to know your mission in one word from Jesus, that word is? All right, you're listening. Brownie points, all of you. So when people ask you, what is your goal? You say, I'm going to love God, and I'm going to love people, and I'm going to try to love those hurting people. I'm going to try to love a world around me that is broken. So no matter what I do with my life, I'm going to try to love. I can do it as a comedian, as a street sweeper, as an auto mechanic, as a school teacher. No matter what you're doing, our mission is love. Love not only the people that have a right to ask for our love, like our immediate family and our friends, but we also need to love people that have no claim upon us, our neighbor, the person that's left for dead at the side of the road that the Good Samaritan took care of. We're to love even our enemies. Friends, when we open our eyes every morning and ask God, help me to see, where can I care more about other people than I care for myself? Somehow the rest of whatever we do in life goes better. Amen? If you can run your company in this way, you'll probably make less profit than somebody that cares only about the bottom of the line especially if they love money more than anything else. So if your definition of success is a profit margin or return on investments or how much money you make, and all of that's measured by money, now that's one way. But if you define your life by trying to bless other people, whether it's your employees or your customers, where somehow you're more interested in working with others, let me give you an example. Have you ever gone to a mechanic? Have you ever gone to one that is more interested in the profit margin? You know, that he gets bonuses based on how many items he sells and what type of mechanical work that he does? Suppose you have another mechanic that says, my job is to bless my customer. My job is to help them to have a safe vehicle. I'm just going to fix what needs fixed. And I'll do that in a way that is most cost-effective as possible. Let me ask you, which of these mechanics would you rather go to? That's how this works. Most people prefer to work with somebody whose driving passion isn't the bottom line. When we work with somebody whose passion is to bless people, now they probably won't make as much money, but I think their rewards will be higher, amen? And then the third one that I'm going to talk about, she tries to give this attitude that the more that we are entrusted with, the more that's required. So if you're an owner of a business or have higher education, she's going to say that even more is expected of you. So you may notice J.K. Rollins. She addressed Harvard in 2008. And she said, if you go to Harvard, you have the best professors in their field. In fact, the students win the lottery to get there. In essence of her commencement address, she says, to whom much is given, much is required. She says, your intelligence, your capacity for hard work, the education that you earned and received gives you a unique status and unique responsibilities. Even your nationality sets you apart. The way that you vote, the way that you live, even the way you protest makes an impact way beyond the borders. That's both a privilege and it's also a burden. 
Now, if you choose to use your status and influence to raise your voice on behalf of those that have no voice, or if you choose to only identify with the powerful and not the powerless, if you retain your life for those that don't have any advantages, then it's only your proud family that celebrates your existence. But if you live for others, then thousands and millions whose reality you have helped change will celebrate you as well. And then it's kind of interesting. She says, we do not need magic. We carry all the power within ourselves already. We have the power to imagine better. In fact, her, her speech reflects the words from Proverbs that says, would you read it with me? Speak up for those that cannot speak for themselves. And then she preaches about James. Would you read this with me? True religion is to care for widows and orphans. Or as Jesus said, would you read it with me? I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. This lady who made billions of dollars telling the story of a sorcerer says we do not need magic to transform our lives. Instead, she said, we carry all the power we need inside of us already. We have the ability to imagine better. And what did Jesus call imagining better? The kingdom of God. She said, there's always one huge obstacle that keeps us from doing these things, and that obstacle is fear. Fear is the thing that keeps us safe and protects us. Sometimes we imagine things more fearful than they really are. Sometimes in life we're meant to take risks. And if we don't, we miss out on the things that God is calling us to do. To pursue the kingdom of God is not always safe. Tell your neighbor it's not safe. It's not always convenient. In fact, it requires a measure of risk that we have to take. That's kind of interesting because researchers say the most fearful group of people are 18 through 35-year-olds. And in fact, there's an inverse relationship between fear and age. The older that we get, the more experience we have and things that we used to be afraid of don't happen to us. And we worry a lot more about stuff that never comes to pass. And as we get older, we have survived a lot and it didn't come to pass. It happened, and here we are. We're still here. Even the thing that we fear the most happens, there's something that's redemptive in them. And through all of the painful things that we walk through, we become the people that we are today. So what are things that people are afraid of? For young adults, it's afraid of failure or disappointing others or criticism. It's fear about the uncertainty of the future or loneliness or rejection. J.K. Rollins describes how she got married very early in life, that she had a child, she ended up getting divorced, she was a single mom, she had a job and lost her job, she's living in poverty. And she survived even in poverty and she was afraid of failing again. So she had this dream of writing this book about a boy named Harry Potter. She really wanted to be a writer, but she was afraid of failing. So she went ahead and wrote this book, but she was afraid that nobody would like it. In fact, the first publisher rejected her book. So she went to 12 different publishers all together, and all of them said the same thing. We're not interested in publishing your book. We don't think it has a future. And the 13th said, don't quit your day job. We're going to give you $3,000 advance for the book. But the person, the publisher said, we think this book is too long for children to read. And adults are not going to be interested in reading a children's story. So we'll, we'll give it a try. Well, friends, five million books later, she tells these Harvard students, don't give in to your fail of fear of failure. Let me ask you by a show of hands, how many of you have ever failed? Okay, 100%, the rest of you are not telling the truth. <laughs> so let me tell you, as graduates, you are going to fail at something. So fail gloriously. 
all of your successes are going to be built on your failures. So don't give up. And then let me tell you this, you're going to be criticized. So let me ask you, and you better do a better job, show of hands. How many of you have ever been criticized by anyone? All right, that's more like it. All of us, everybody has been criticized. If you haven't been criticized, you've never stood up for something that's important or you haven't done anything important. You know what we just need to learn to say is, you know what, I'm sorry, I messed up. It's impossible to live our lives without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you haven't lived at all. There are times that we're going to be afraid. You know, the first time I took a mission trip, even ones here in the United States and even across the seas, I was a bit afraid. But after the experience, I never regretted going. If you live with fear of something bad happening to you, friends, you are going to miss some incredible experiences in life. My hope and prayer is that we don't make decisions based on our fears, but based on the kingdom of God's love. I believe that the world is changed when we live as kingdom-minded people. And my hope is that you're those kind of people, that you're willing to take a risk and you're willing to live your lives as Jesus' people. So friends, let's pray. Lord, we're grateful that Jesus came to show us what the kingdom of God looks like, how he calls us to follow him and live as his disciples. Lord, you sent us out by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you do that every day. And we are to look as your disciples to see where the world doesn't look like the kingdom of God and help close that gap. So, Lord, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and hearts of courage to pursue what you call us to pursue. Help us to not be afraid of failing, of criticism, or danger. Help us to offer ourselves to you every single day. Use us, we pray, to live as a life of love. In your holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Carl and Janet. I was thinking in, in terms of our graduates, we don't want them living down by the river in a van, but <laughs> that's another story. Friends, it's time for us to, to uh, do our joys and concerns. Would you, would you be in an attitude of prayer? Dear gracious Lord, we lift up the situation in Ukraine. We just lift up all of those who've lost loved ones and family and for all of the refugees that have been displaced. We just ask that they would be met with open arms and that they would be able to find refuge and be able to get the basic necessities that they need to live. And Lord, we're just asking in, in your great power that you would end the war and bring things back to some type of normalcy. We lift up Steve Wiles and we just ask that he would have more good days. We just know that he's been dealing with a lot of different health issues. So we're just asking that he's able to be comfortable and that he, you open his lungs and allow him to breathe. We also lift up Barb's daughter for continued healing. And Lord, we just lift up Beth. We just ask that you surround her with your love. We ask that you give the doctors wisdom and discernment as they decide next steps forward. And Lord, we're just asking that you eradicate all cancers and that you allow people to live free and, and do your will. We lift up Kaylee and Caitlin as they graduate and start a new phase of their life. Now they have lots of excitement and lots of fears that they're able to overcome those and that they're able to, to give glory to God in all that they do and that they're able to love others and, and to love uh, their neighbors. Would you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come to the time where we give our tithes and our offerings, and just know that there's people that have been coming in with the gas prices soaring that need a tank full of gas or that come for a night stay at the hotel, and all of that's possible because of your giving. So ushers, would you please come? <laughs> Let's pray. Dear gracious Lord, we thank you for these gifts and these givers. We ask that you would multiply them so that we're able to make more disciples for the transformation of the world. 
And Lord, we lift up those that we are able to help with gas and with stays at the hotel. We just ask that you give them a hand up so that they're able to get on their own and, and be able to help others. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Friends, would you join me in singing, Come, We That Love the Lord. Friends, may you look around the world and see where there needs to be a difference, and may you make that gap smaller. You may be seated. <laughs> 